So, brief, brief in introduction. Uh, so this is a picture from uh, Nobel Museum in Sweden. And uh, they have a poetry wall where you can put together random words. Uh, and this is what I came up with. Um, and I, I started using this instead of a slide that I usually had, which was basically talking about uh, me, like a standard introduction, uh, talking about how I'm currently a, a key director at Audible. Um, and if you're not familiar with Audible, uh, Audible is a leading audiobook company and we're a subsidiary of Amazon. Uh, previously, I've run uh, DevOps, uh, test automation and QA teams uh, in various industries. I also started uh, my own meetup uh, around four years back, which is called DevOps QA. And the meetup runs uh, just across the river in uh, New Jersey. So if any of you are in the area, please attend it. We try to meet every month and we have uh, speakers from all different uh, you know, fun companies like MongoDB, Elasticsearch, uh, uh, we talk about test automation, test environments, uh, um, and various other topics. Uh, but I felt that this better describes who I am and why I'm here. So, what is uh, continuous delivery? So, I found this random definitions online, uh, but Basically, uh, the one that I like the most said, just replace the word continuous with the word somewhat automated, and that will explain to you what uh, continuous really means. And uh, while it's supposed to be funny, I mean, unfortunately, it is mostly true. Uh, it's very rare that you see somebody who was able to fully get to continuous integration testing and delivery. And I'm just wondering, like, since you're here in the room, how many of you are familiar with continuous integration delivery? And how many of you are actually practicing it currently at work? Okay, that's great. That's actually more than I usually <laughs> see. So hopefully, you know, you have some interesting questions or show, stories to share. <coughs> so briefly about what continuous uh, integration delivery and deployment are. Uh, so continuous integration means that after every commit, uh, you can run your, you can do your build, uh, your unit tests, and your deployment uh, to the next environment automatically. Uh, so basically, for every commit, before it gets to testing, you already have some basic unit testing done. Continuous delivery means that your code can go all the way through the cycle up until the release uh, without any manual intervention. And then continuous deployment means that everything, including production deployment, is fully automated. While it does seem like continuous deployment is what everybody should target, that's not generally the case. Some companies, while they have no issues automating the deployment, they actually choose not to. And some examples might be companies that have very high risk products, uh, like in the medical industry, like even though you have everything automated, you still want to have somebody physically deploying it to production before, uh, you know, before you make that decision. So as I mentioned, there are lots of definitions. Uh, however, this one is my favorite. It was originally coined by John Willis, and it's known as uh, COMS. And what it says is that uh, continuous delivery and DevOps are about a lot of those different things. So first, it's about culture, and the idea is that whether or not you have things automated uh, or you believe in doing continuous integration, if people in your company are not ready to shift their mindset and think about delivering things continuously, re getting rid of their manual bottlenecks, you're not going to be able to do this. Uh, next, once you actually have the buy-in from the people, that's when automation comes in. So you cannot have DevOps or continuous delivery without automation. You have to identify all your processes that are done manually, and if possible, uh, use different tools to automate them. Uh, next one is Lean. Uh, Lean is about uh, getting your feed feedback loop as fast as possible. Right? You don't want developer to commit something and then five days later to find out that, that they broke uh, an existing feature. They want to find out right away. And that's a big part of continuous delivery, is getting that feedback to back to developers, back to testers as soon as possible. Monitoring is how you get that feedback loop. So whatever you have, your tests, your 
product, uh, you need to have monitoring and alerts in place to know right away if something is broken, if something is not behaving the way it's supposed to behave, if you have uh, latency that was not there before, and that's where monitoring comes in. And finally, sharing. Sharing is what uh, I'm doing here today and a lot of you are doing here today. Uh, it's about uh, practicing this and then sharing your mistakes, lessons learned, good experiences with others so that they can learn from it and improve. Uh, because in continuous delivery, you also need to have continuous improvement. So every time you learn something from your monitoring, you want to change it and move forward. One thing that you'll see consistently in my presentations are inspirational quotes. I actually collect them. And I feel that some of them can really explain concepts to you and inspire you to do something differently. Uh, so this one uh, is by Charles Darwin and says, it's not the strongest of the species that survive, not the most intelligent, but the one most adaptable to change. And I think it applies really well to this topic because as I mentioned, culture is one of the most important components of it. So unless you're willing to adapt to change, you're not going to be able to do this. So step one is identifying the bottlenecks. I feel that while like tools and processes are important, identifying bottlenecks is probably the most important thing you can do in order to get started on this journey. Uh, so a brief story, uh, five, five or six years ago, I joined a new uh, technology company that were doing this big data ETL. And I joined as a new manager uh, to build a new QA team. And the VP of technology walked into my office, so welcoming and smiling, and says like, uh, you know, I'm sure you're getting started here, you know, you'll have enough time to get situated, but in two weeks, can you please meet with me and all the senior tech and present how you're gonna solve our problems? And that worried me a little bit, right? I'm, it's my first day, I don't know anything. Uh, and basically, like, their main problem was that their development cycle was too long. It was taking them a month to release new features to the customers. Uh, so they brought me in and they were looking to me to say, well, how am I going to reduce that one month to, I don't know, two weeks, one week, a day? Uh, so that was the problem statement. So the things I did to figure out uh, what those problems are, are things that I'm now sharing with others. Uh, so, first thing I did, and actually let me do this first. Uh, so around that uh, time, I read the book called The Phoenix Project. And one of the statements that really stuck with me from that book is this one, which says, any improvements made anywhere besides the bottleneck is, uh, are an illusion. And what this meant to me uh, was, if you fix things before your bottleneck, uh, you actually make your bottleneck worse because your throughput is now going to be even higher and the bottleneck is still there so it's just going to pile up in front of your bottleneck. If you improve things after your bottleneck, uh, let's say your deployment process uh, while your testing is the actual bottleneck, then you're going to have your operations team just sitting there and doing nothing and waiting for the work to come. Uh, so that I think really emphasizes why is it important to identify the bottlenecks and also identify the biggest bottlenecks first and fix them before you move on to something else. So these are the few techniques that I've used to help identify bottlenecks. And the first one is actually what I used in that company that I just told you about earlier. Uh, only a few weeks before I attended this conference and there was this company called Innovation Games and they were presenting different games that you can play in order to facilitate various uh, processes like uh, bottleneck identification. So a speedboat, speedboat game works as follows. It basically says that whatever process you're trying to analyze is your speedboat. So in this case, our speedboat was our software delivery process. Uh, so imagine that it's your boat, but then there are anchors that are holding back your boat and keeping it from moving forward. So those anchors are your bottlenecks. And the deeper the anchor, the higher the bottleneck. So the way this game is played, it's available online, so you can play it with your remote teams, or you can just draw a boat on a piece of paper and play it that way. You get a small group of people, you give them limited number of anchors. So you don't say, you know, just come up with anything. Let's say they have 10 anchors to share between five people. 
So they really have to discuss uh, what are those top anchors, and then they come in and they place those anchors uh, under the boat. So by the end of the exercise, you actually come out with a really good list of prioritized bottlenecks, and then you can play it with multiple groups in the company. And I think what you end up seeing normally is that people come up with a common set of anchors. And usually the one that's most common is the one that you should start addressing first. Some other tools that uh, you're probably familiar with are uh, things like mind maps. Uh, so mind map I found is a great tool to just, if you do brainstorming sessions and you're gathering people's ideas, it's a really nice way to record uh, the notes instead of trying to make it linear. And it will also help you to start where you left off and just continue. Uh, retrospective is uh, something that all the agile teams use. But what I found is attending other teams' retrospective is like, an amazing way to learn about what works and what doesn't work in the company. Uh, so in my first week uh, in the company, I got to attend this uh, uh, spring planning retrospective, which had like all the teams uh, in a room, and everybody was talking about things that worked that didn't work, and I was just sitting there taking notes, and things that didn't work were probably like almost 100% corresponding to the same anchors that were in the vote. And then finally, uh, identifying people in the company that one, represent various parts of the company, like customer support, operations, QA, development, and then also you want to identify people who are most influential in the company. Influential not because they're senior, but influential because people consider them thought leaders. <coughs> and those are the people you really want to talk to because one, they'll probably give you a lot of useful information. Uh, and second, what I did, I formed a group of those type of people. And before I went and presented something to senior management, I presented it to that group. And that was a group of some uh, senior developers, some uh, operations people. And I presented my ideas. They gave me feedback. I actually corrected some of those things. And then once I saw, uh, gave it to senior leadership, the engineers already were bought in. So actually implementing it was very easy. Because I didn't have to go and sell it top, top down. It basically came bottom up. Mapping a delivery uh, pipeline is something that I found very, very helpful. Uh, so in that same company, I had a big uh, whiteboard in my office. And in the first months, as I was doing these interviews and brainstorming sessions and attending retrospective, I started drawing uh, the picture of how does the product actually, how does the feature get delivered to customers? Who are all the players along the way? What are the different handovers? Like I found out that there are some things that marketing needs to do along the way to actually verify that uh, the dates that developers committed to correspond to the dates that they're communicating to the customer. So you learn about all these things that actually impact the software delivery cycle. And one thing I found is generally if you come to a new company, it's almost impossible to find this type of a picture. Like no matter who you go to, like nobody really has this full picture view into how a product gets delivered. So if you are the person who actually draws this, like you'll have people coming to you from all over the company and asking you questions. Step number two. So now we're moving to the technology part of the implementation. Uh, so very important, setting up common repository for all your artifacts. And it seems, uh, I think, almost trivial at this point. Everybody, I think, uses version management systems uh, for their code. Uh, however, I, I still see that some people do not consider tests as something that needs to be version managed. Uh, in many cases, uh, you know, if you're using Excel files, they might live in an Excel file on your computer. Even if you use uh, test case management systems like Quality Center or Jira or Test Trails, uh, you might only have the latest version of it, and if something changes, if somebody changes the feature, you go ahead and you change your test case, and then two weeks later they decide that no, they want to go back to the previous version, but you already lost your previous test case and you have to rewrite it. Also things like um, infrastructure configuration, and we'll talk about it later as well, but your environment configuration should also be treated as a script. Ideally, and you should always be able to go from one version to another and version manage it just like everything else. Also, release notes. 
uh, how many times like I've been in a situation where we find an issue and then we're trying to work our way backwards to figure out when was this thing introduced. So if you have your release notes for every single release and you can easily go back and find out what happened two weeks ago, what was committed, uh, it helps a lot to debug those things. Yes. Uh, do you tie your release note size them back to traceable back to individual issues or how do you maintain that traceability or do you? Uh, at this point, I mean, we just have release notes okay. for every single release, okay. which lists all the commits that are part of those, all the bugs that were found during that release and fixed. So release notes item also have a reference to a comment? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Step number three, automating the build and deployment. And again, I think a lot of uh, companies already are doing it. If you are doing continuous integration delivery, then definitely you have your build and deployments automated. Uh, however, if you're not, you cannot have continuous integration. And uh, I've seen, uh, I, I've been in a company where the tool, uh, the product that we delivered had to be supported on a lot of different uh, operating systems. So we actually had a person manually build it on different versions of Linux and Unix and Windows. Um, and when we came in and just automated it, it just saved hours, like right away, without really doing anything, uh, like any significant time on it. And then of course, as you automate the build, you, want, you also want to have your unit tests automated because you want to verify that the build uh, is not breaking any of the basic existing functionality. And if the unit tests uh, are not working, then you should not, uh, you should not have a successful build. Right? So this is basically what comprises the continuous integration. You have your build automated, uh, you build code uh, inside of a continuous integration server like Jenkins uh, or TeamCity and then after the build you run your unit tests and if the unit tests are broken then you break the build and then somebody has to go in and fix it before you can actually deploy it to the next stage. Step number four uh, is collecting quality metrics. Uh, and the idea is, again, this goes back to the feedback loop. So every time you commit the code, your unit test already provides you some input into how well the quality it is. But then there are a lot of other tools that can give you additional information. Uh, there are tools that can tell you uh, about code coverage, right? So it's very important to say that I created my unit test, but I want to make sure that my coverage did not go down. Uh, security vulnerabilities. Uh, there are tools like Fortify that can do static analysis of your code and tell you if you broke any, if you broke anything, or maybe you didn't even break anything, but some code that you wrote could actually introduce a new security vulnerability into your product. Accessibility evaluation, uh, and we had some discussions on that also, but you also want to analyze your code to see if maybe something that you created is actually impacting your uh, accessibility customers. Uh, coding standards, memory leaks can be detected statically. SEO is something that we started doing recently. Um, and again, SEO is similar to accessibility, where as long as you use certain things in your code, uh, it will be recognized uh, by Google, and it will be ranked accordingly during the search. So if you break that, then potentially your customers are not going to be able to find your website uh, and that in, in effect that impacts customers as well. Uh, so we actually had a presentation recently at Audible where somebody said like we are very customer obsessed but we should treat uh, Google bots like our customers because they're out there finding your products for people. So if you break that code it means that uh, it should be equivalent to a high severity bug. And then finally things like code reviews. Uh, Again, probably standard practice in most of the places, but it needs to be part of this process. And uh, it can be actually part of the continuous delivery process, even though the review itself is done manually, but the tool can send out the code reviews. As soon as the review is done, it's gonna send that feedback back, and then it can promote things to the next stage. Step number five is automated environments. And I briefly mentioned this before, but environment 
should be treated and it can be treated just like your other code. Uh, so if you need to create, if you need to set up certain uh, things in your environment, if you need to set up certain variables, if you need to install certain software, all of that can be done via a script and that script can be stored in a version management system and uh, this is also a script that you can include with your uh, tickets so if something fails and you want to report back to the developer you can actually give a link to the script that you use to create that environment and then the developer will be able to reproduce that defect exactly in the environment that was there during the testing so there are a lot of great tools out there that help you create that and then uh, do at at automated configuration uh, there are also right now great technologies around cloud uh, environments uh, or if you have some security concerns and you don't want to go to the cloud, there are great virtualization software. So potentially if you have your environment uh, as code, you can either bring up your VM, so bring up your uh, cloud environment, run that script there, set it up, run your tests, and then potentially have that environment shut down and then do the same thing next time you run. And then, of course, if you have your environment automated, or even if you don't, uh, you should also consist consistently monitor your environment. Uh, things like infrastructure, uh, you know, your backend system, everything needs to be continuously tested. And if something doesn't work, you need to be notified right away. Uh, so, you know, how many times have you uh, had your tests that are supposed to run overnight, not even start because uh, UDB decided to change a password on your database and all of a sudden all the tests failed because they couldn't even access it. Uh, or you, one of your uh, servers went down and because of that again like your 10,000 tests that were supposed to be finished by the morning none of them ran because of that. So continuously testing all your dependencies is really critical to having your automation be stable and actually have automation be successful because otherwise people will perceive it as flaky, as non-reliable, and they're going to go back to doing things manually, which is why most of the time continuous delivery doesn't happen. Because people try it out, they think, oh, this is so great, and then they start seeing some failures, some flakiness, and like, no, we're just going to do it manually like we did before. And this will basically solve your famous problem of, uh, but this works on my machine. So <laughs> if you have environments automated, developers cannot use that excuse. And there is like a quick joke about that where it says, how many developers does it take to uh, fix a light bulb? And the answer is none, because it always works on their machine. <laughs> but if there are any developers here, there is a similar joke about testers, which says, how many testers does it take to fix a light bulb? And there is things also none, because testers don't fix things, they only find problems. <laughs> Uh, next, uh, test automation, and I'm sure there, I mean we had a session in this room before about uh, test automation, I'm sure there will be a lot more discussions on that, so definitely this is a huge component of uh, continuous integration and delivery. But before we go to testing, you need also to have your test data automated. And I've seen this in many cases where we had all these automation scripts running, but before you actually can run automation, you need to send a request to your DBA to give you some test accounts that you can actually input. And that's a manual process. That means you no longer have continuous delivery, right? Or if you need to go and create a test account before. So whatever procedure you currently use to create your test data, you need to automate it. Uh, whether it's uh, using an existing website to actually go in and create your users or running some SQL queries to pull existing data um, and then feeding the data automatically in your automation suites. Uh, also cleaning up the data because in many cases you need to have data in a certain state. So once you change the state, the next time you run the script it's not going to work. So either always starting with a fresh set of accounts or bringing the accounts that you have back to the state that it needs to be in for your test. And this is the famous uh, testing pyramid. And uh, I think just an hour earlier, somebody showed the 
uh, automation snowman, uh, which I guess the idea is the same, uh, that in general, you want your largest set of tests to be your unit tests because they're the fastest and most stable. Uh, then you want to automate as much as possible on your API layer, so have your integration suite uh, running uh, on a regular basis after every commit. And then finally you have your UI tests, which are not as stable, generally take longer. Um, and then once you have all of that automated, there is still the cloud on the top where if you really want to test your product thoroughly, you still want to do exploratory testing because you cannot automate for everything. Uh, in some cases, uh, like even though this is an ideal state, like I found situations where you have so much business logic built on top of your APIs that you cannot avoid the GUI tests and your tough triangle ends up being much larger because this is where all your business logic lives. Right? So even if you automate all the services, you're not really able to automate anything on them. Um, some things that automation is really great for is parallel execution, and that's what actually makes it fast. Right? Generally, automation, if you just create one script automate and automate it, and you have a person do it manually, it does not necessarily mean that automation is going to run faster. However, if you run those scripts on uh, 20 different machines, then of course it's going to finish much faster. Also, using automation to run on different browsers and different devices uh, is a great use of that. Uh, and finally, I, if you are in a company that was able to automate everything or almost everything, then you might end up with a huge set of tests which take hours or even days to run, even if you run it on multiple <laughs> machines. In that case, you should also implement selective testing in your frameworks so that you can select the tests that are relevant to the changes that you're trying to test. And that needs to be built in into the actual framework uh, when you develop it. And this is a quick uh, video that I wanted to show you. And I want to see if there is sound here. She doesn't want to play. <laughs> Sorry, give me one second. Let's try this one. <sighs> All right. I guess that's what usually happens during the <laughs> when you try to do something interactive in your presentations. All right. So I won't play that video, but I'll quickly tell you what it's supposed to, <laughs> the point that it's supposed to make. Uh, basically, uh, it shows you this uh, footballs that are flying from side to side on a screen, and uh, you're supposed to watch the screen and uh, count how many footballs there are. And every time that I play this, people sit there focusing and counting those footballs. If you're, if you're able to count really, really well, then you end up counting 23 footballs. Um, and then afterwards, uh, you realize that the whole time that you were counting, there was a scroll bar underneath which says stop counting, there are 23 footballs. Uh, however, nobody usually sees that. Uh, and, <laughs> and the point of this uh, small uh, video is to realize that uh, you do miss things that you're not uh, looking for. Uh, and even though I've spent my whole life doing automation, I guess I developed automation frameworks, I run automation teams, I think it only led me to realize that you cannot automate everything. You should definitely automate everything that you can. You should automate regression. Uh, you should automate uh, e even like new features, things that are data-driven, things that are repetitive. Uh, but you still want to have that exploratory testing component. And depending on how risky, again, uh, your have an issue in your product is, you make a decision whether or not you can just do continuous deployments on the product, making sure that there is nothing hidden that's broken. And there are plenty of companies out there that made the decision to move to continuous delivery, continuous deployment, and the worst thing that happens is a customer sees a broken feature. I mean, how many times did Facebook do an update and you found something that doesn't work for you and then the next day it works again. 
right? I mean, it's uh, there are some products that can afford it and some products that can't. And one thing that we're exploring right now at Audible is uh, model-based testing, uh, which uh, uh, which is an approach, uh, automation approach that actually allows you to somewhat automate the exploratory testing, where you build models around your requirements. And then when your tests run, they can actually go into any different uh, branches of your product. So instead of actually scripting and telling your script what to do, the script is going to run and decide where it's going to go. And it somewhat represents what a person would do when they're doing exploratory testing. Uh, and this actually serves as your requirements, as your test cases, and also as your automation scripts. Uh, so somewhat similar to the behavior-driven testing that the uh, speaker was talking about earlier, uh, where you have a single source of truth, uh, but this is built in terms of models and can help to facilitate the exploratory testing as well. And this I felt was an appropriate quote uh, for this, and it's uh, from Albert Einstein who said, Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Right? And that's what automation is. You actually don't want different results. You expect if it always passed, you want it to continue passing. But then you still might have those cases where uh, you don't know what to expect. So step number seven is performance testing. And I think, again, everybody does performance testing. But in many cases, performance testing is done by a completely separate team. Uh, in uh, Amazon, in some cases, it's done as this big event, which is called Game Days, uh, before Thanksgiving or Christmas or Prime Days. Uh, however, performance can break just like feature as a result of a single commit, right? Like a developer can make one change that's going to completely <laughs> destroy your uh, load time. And being able to run some basic performance tests after every commit is pretty critical because performance issue can actually result in customers leaving site just like a broken feature is. So there are different types of performance tests. Some of them you can do, like I said, as part of every commit. Things like soak test, which basically runs over a long period of time to make sure there are no memory links and such. You probably won't be able to do after every commit, uh, but you can at least do it regularly, maybe run it overnight. Um, and then finally, the last point here is the user experience test. And very often when, it, when we think about performance, we think about server-side performance. Uh, how long does it take for the server to return the response? Uh, however, I think right now the websites and apps are so interactive that there is a lot going on after server returns that response. Uh, we use a lot of uh, tracking for marketing purposes uh, on the sites, which actually also add to your load time. Uh, we use a lot of images on the site that can add to the load time. Uh, so actually testing that client-side performance uh, is something that we also need to think about and do on a regular basis. Step number eight automating test results analysis and reporting. Uh, and the reason I think this is very important is uh, from my experience, we've been spending a lot of time developing automation scripts. Like I know my teams like, sp spend time developing frameworks, writing scripts. However, once the script runs, it spits out some test results report, like if you're using Selenium, uh, it has its own format. If you use QTP, it has its own test results. And we would normally just send that test report to developers or analyze it ourselves, and that's it. Uh, however, test results are probably more important than your actual scripts. The reason you automate your scripts is because you want to know if your product passed or failed. So how you report that uh, is extremely important to how receptive people are going to be to using automation and how useful they're going to consider it. So for example, things like consolidated results. Uh, so an example I can give you, that same company I was talking about before, uh, they had all those different machines, Unix, Linux, Windows, running automated tests. And then at the end, it created a test report. And each test report lived on the machine where it was created. And then we had one person who had to manually copy all those into a single location and then analyze them. And then instead, we created a very short Python script that went and it grabbed all those results, consolidated into a single 
Excel file and then allowed to filter by uh, test failure, machine name, uh, operating system and such. And all of a sudden we could right away see if uh, the single feature failed only on Unix or maybe everything failed on Windows 8 but didn't fail on Windows 7. And uh, the test results became a lot more useful and it also saved a lot of time for that engineer who actually had to copy it manually. And what, what I was just mentioning is actually the failure root cause analysis. Uh, so you, you don't have to just spit out the report, you can actually take it a step further and analyze it automatically. So one example I gave is look for similar fa failure messages and then try to understand what is common between them. Like, are, are all those failure messages happening on the same browser? Are all of them happening on the same operating system? Or are they all related to the same user account that you used? And that can actually almost right away help you to debug the issue and say, well, this failed because it was related to this specific membership type or this specific uh, browser failure. Um, automated defect logging is something that uh, you can definitely do. Things like Jira, Quality Center, and others have APIs that you can leverage. In many cases, people don't want to do it because you might have uh, 100 tests fail for the same reason and you don't want to open 100 defects. So unless you have a very good root cause analysis in place, you shouldn't probably just log defects automatically. Automated email notifications, again, very simple and something I found very useful. Unfortunately, people don't tend to read reports, but they do tend to read emails. So if they have something jump out in the email that says red, this failed, like they might actually pay attention to it. Uh, but if you tell them that there is a process where they need to go somewhere and check the results, they're probably not going to do it. Um, and then reporting dashboards is something that uh, I started leveraging recently more and more. There are some really, really great uh, business intelligence tools which normally you wouldn't associate with testing, but they can actually really help you visualize your test report data, your automation health. Uh, so we started using the Elastic stack where we store all of our data in the Elastic search and then we use Kibana to visualize it. And the results just look so much better and are manageable and you can interact with those dashboards, drill into things, figure out why things fail, etc. So leveraging uh, those tools is something that I would definitely recommend. Step number nine, ensure continuous feedback. Uh, so I don't know how many of you have seen this picture before, but uh, this was taken in San Diego where they had a lot of issues with drivers not following the, uh, the speed limit signs and they had like several streets where it was very dangerous when the cars were speeding. So they did an experiment. On one street they had policemen with speed detectors and on another street they had the speed limit with this uh, uh, tableau which says what your speed is. So how many of you here think that the policemen were more effective? <laughs> okay, how, how about the speed limit sign? All right, it's a split. Uh, so this was the speed limit sign with the your speed sign was much more effective actually. And the reason is that this is a perfect example of a feedback loop. So if you just had a sign saying speed limit 25, people ignored it. But if it actually showed speed limit 25 and your speed is 33, people actually tend to slow down and they slow down more. Uh, and it eventually, like those streets is where people start slowing down. But on the other one, it's not feedback loop, it's something where you break a rule, then you get a ticket. <laughs> and you don't necessarily learn from that. Um, so feedback loops are extremely important. You want to know right away uh, if something that you're doing is actually breaking something else, just like the speed limit, like you know right away if you're breaking the law or not. Uh, so how can you do those, how can you get those feedback loops? Uh, so things like post-mortem analysis, right? If something, uh, if you did miss a bug during testing, uh, you want to understand why, right? You don't just uh, have developers fix the bug, close the bug and be happy that it's done with. Uh, you need to understand why the issue occurred. 
uh, and whatever the underlying root cause is actually fix it so it doesn't happen in the future. It could be a missed requirement, it could be you might develop an automated test to cover it, it could be an extra scenario like in your data list that you have in front, uh, and that's how you continuously improve your uh, automation suite. Logging application and process data is critical, so every single thing that happens should be logged. Uh, so if you need, if something breaks, you can get that feedback right away. Or if something is not behaving correctly, the, it can trigger some alert system to let you know about it. Uh, monitoring health of your automation. I think somebody mentioned it before. You should treat your automation like you would your product. You want to know all the time whether or not it's behaving as expected. Are the tests starting to consistently fail? Are the tests running slower than they used to? Because again, there might be some underlying reasons behind it and you want to fix them as soon as possible. Uh, and finally, monitoring KPIs and staying on top of technical debt is really important. And I'll talk a, little, a bit about, uh, more about this here. Uh, so the KPIs that you want to monitor, and there are a lot, but these are the ones that I like to focus on. Uh, first is speed to deployment versus bug missed. So definitely, when if you do continuous delivery, one of the reasons you're doing it is because you want to start deploying things to production uh, faster. Uh, however, uh, if you are deploying to production more and more often, but as you're doing it, your bugs are becoming more and more and more, then you probably need to stop and uh, <laughs> take a step back because you're probably doing something wrong. Right? If you're deploying faster because you're running less tests and because of that you're missing all these issues, then you're not really doing continuous delivery because your cu customer is suffering and then your developers need to spend time fixing those issues. Uh, change volume and complexity, again, like looking at um, how many changes are going into production all the time and what's the complexity of those changes. Uh, tracking open versus resolved. Uh, uh, as, as you're doing continuous delivery, one of the side effects is, <laughs> a good side effect is that the developer uh, code quality should continuously improve. So you should actually be opening less defects. Uh, however, if you are opening defects, you want also developers to keep up with those open defects. Otherwise, your technical debt is gonna grow. And then customer issue volume, obviously, again, you don't want your customer issues to go up because now you're running automation, you're not doing any manual testing. And then meantime to recovery, if something does go wrong, if you do get a severity to one issue, how fast can you recover? Uh, do you have a good rollback procedure in place? Do you have automated rollback? If your servers crash, do you have a system in, uh, in place to bring up uh, new, new VMs and replace those? So all of those things need to be considered. Uh, but I think one of the biggest things to keep in mind is like, you need to stay on top of your technical debt uh, because that's a very common bad side effect of continuous delivery is the technical debt starts growing. Whether it's the number of uh, aging defects that you have, like especially low priority ones, those are the ones that usually <laughs> start getting thrown under the rug or some process improvements uh, that you don't have time for uh, that could, could have otherwise continued to improve your processes. So definitely make sure that you have a backlog of technical debt and, and it's consistently being prioritized by both test and development teams. So finally the last step uh, is managing and realistic expectation. And what that means is automation is great, continuous delivery is great, but a lot of Especially senior managers, I think, expect magic <laughs> when you say continuous delivery. And that's not always the case, right? There is a lot of work involved, there is a lot of maintenance involved, and not everything can be 100% automated. And people need to understand this. So if you do choose to automate everything that you can and run things continuously, you will probably have bugs in production. Uh, so as long as people accept that and it becomes part of the process to fix those bugs, review why they happened, introduce that into your uh, next cycle of uh, automation scripts, then it might be fine. Finally, there is this quote which says, great leaders don't blame the tools they are given, great leaders work to sharpen them. So if you saw on every single slide that I shared, there were a lot of different tools. 
And the reason that I didn't focus on any specific tool is because I think at this day and age, actually most of those tools can probably get the job done. Like I've tried multiple and some companies prefer Jenkins, some companies prefer TeamCity, Amazon has uh, our own continuous integration server and they're all able to get uh, the code from environment to environment and uh, integrate unit tests with it. Uh, however, the key is to find tools that are right for you uh, and don't get stuck to a specific tool. Uh, so. It, I don't know if you've seen this, but there is this great uh, resource and uh, Xibia Lab developed it. It's called Periodic Table of DevOps. And if you go to the, if you search for it on a website, each one of these is actually a link. So if you want to know about those tools, you can click and it will take you to the page which will tell you exactly what those tools do. And this is probably a few years old, so I'm sure this has grown. I don't know if they came out with a new version, but uh, I know at least a couple of tools that are not even on this list. So just to summarize uh, what I've spoken about, um, in order to have continuous delivery, you want to have everything version managed, including your test, your documentation, your release notes, uh, and your code artifacts, of course. Uh, you want to have a continuous integration server in which you have your builds, test data, environments, uh, regression tests, and reporting all automated. And in order for it to actually be reliable, your environments need to mimic your production environments because otherwise you're going to end up finding new issues in production that you didn't know about before. And then the most critical component to make this all work is people, culture, you, <laughs> communication, because otherwise, like if you don't talk to people, if you don't understand what that continuous delivery, uh, if your product delivery cycle looks like, you're not really going to be able to identify those bottlenecks. So this is a call to action. Like I said, there were lots of tools, lots of different ideas. You might be doing all of them already, but if there was at least one that you haven't seen before, hopefully you can bring it back and try it out. Um, and I think you know it would be great if I see you again in the future. You know to let me know how it works. Uh, so this is the quote that I usually end my presentation on, and it goes back to that big list of tools. Uh, and this says, "Fall in love with the pro problem, not the solution," because there are many, many solutions. Uh, but you need to always understand what that problem is. But there is a better quote that I heard at Grace Hopper conference this year. Um, and the quote says, uh, in our final days, we'll be judged on two things, the problems we create and the problems we solve. So let's find a good problem to solve. So for me personally, continuous delivery is a very good problem to solve. And since you're here, probably you feel the same way. Thank you. Have, uh, do I have some time? Yeah. Maybe not, but uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll be here until the end of the day, so we can definitely talk. Also, if you want to try out Audible, I brought some free listen cards. There are books like Phoenix Projects are available on Audible. It's great to listen to while you drive. And one last quick thing, I mentioned that I run my own meetup, uh, DevOps PA. So my next meetup, I'm planning to do this continuous delivery game. Uh, this game I actually just played for the first time a few months back in Sweden. And it was invented in Sweden, so they don't, they don't sell it on Amazon. Uh, but it actually shows you how you can get features through development as operations into production and you do it in this really fun way. So if you like board games and you want to learn more about continuous delivery, this might be a really cool thing to try. Uh, so if you want, join the last game meetup and uh, I'll let you know when the next uh, session is going to be. All right. Thank you very much.